Nintendo, a company we fondly know well for their amazing software and hardware. Hardware that just looking at them are iconic to many of our eyes. While many of these may have been a success, lesser known are add-on peripherals made for such hardware that weren't. With these three in particular being designed to expand upon games through both storage and online. And so today on Gaming History, we'll be looking at the history of Nintendo's failed peripherals. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the subscribe button and hit the notification bell to further support us and keep creating new videos. In 1993, Nintendo in a partnership with Silicon Graphics began development for the Nintendo 64, then codenamed Project Reality. While Silicon Graphics were responsible for developing the hardware, one major question was present. What should the storage medium be? The gaming industry was more and more heading towards the path of CDs due to their massive size of 700 megabytes allowing one to make very massive games with even FMV cutscenes to be stored in them. PC gaming was already utilizing these over the now defunct floppy disks, and both Sega and Hudson Soft were bringing their CD add-ons to their consoles. As obvious as the choice was, CDs did pose one major problem, load times. While cartridges can load almost instantly into a game and load a different area lightning quick, CDs had load times and this made Nintendo nervous. With these keeping Nintendo from deciding, in 1994, Chairman of Nintendo of America, Howard Lincoln, stated, Right now, cartridges offer faster access time and more speed of movement and characters than CDs. So we'll introduce our new hardware with cartridges. But eventually, these problems with CDs will be overcome. When that happens, you'll see Nintendo using CD as the software storage medium for our 64-bit system. While there was a great deal of indecision, Nintendo decided to simply do both. Going back to its history of the Famicom, it had a a successful add-on known as the Famicom Disk System that used larger floppy disks for more storage, while regular cartridges were still in use. The same was going to be done for the Super Nintendo with a CD add-on that had been cancelled due to disagreements with Sony. Thus, Nintendo planned to make the Nintendo 64 follow in their footsteps with an add-on to also sate their storage issues, titled as the 64 Disk Drive. With their storage issues resolved via an add-on, it was as such decided later in 1994 that the N64 would use silicon cartridges. A statement from Vice President of Marketing Peter Main stated that the choice we made is not cartridge versus CD, it's silicon over optical. When it comes to speed, no other format approaches the silicon-based cartridge. It was November 1995, and Nintendo Shoshinkai event was underway. An event held by Nintendo to showcase new games and hardware, and this was going to be heavily focused on the Nintendo 64, showcasing the console, its controllers, and a number of its add-ons with many games including Super Mario 64, Zelda 64, Star Fox 64, GoldenEye, and much more. During their presentation, Nintendo in a controversial move presented that it would use a cartridge-based medium, launching in only 4, 8, and 12 megabyte cartridge sizes for games. Extremely small compared to the PlayStation 700 megabytes, but it in exchange offered nearly no load times. This was considered a controversial move to both fans and especially developers who wish to make larger games. However, at the same time, Nintendo unveiled one other surprise, an add-on called the 64 Disk Drive. While no images were shown at the show, they did state that it would be using a 3 and 3 quarter inch magnetic storage medium that would hold massive storage, and with a release date of late 1996, just shortly after the N64's release. Along with that, a small announcement was made as to one of its first games, The Legend of Zelda. The game just shown off in a technical demo was going to be one of the first disk drive exclusive games. It was considered a surprise move for such a flagship series to be on this add-on that even Nintendo Power commented about the surprise. Nintendo wouldn't comment any further on how Zelda was going to take advantage of the hardware. They mentioned several disk uses in general terms, including the ability to save games and customize many game elements. Elements. Whatever that meant wasn't going to be revealed just yet, as the focus went to publicize the main console itself, the Nintendo 64. But it was clear that Zelda 64 was going to be its designated killer app. While magazines did occasionally bring up the disk drive, it was mainly squared around the N64 and its hyped launch with Super Mario 64, which was its killer app. It was to the point where without much talking about it, some even thought that the 64DD was already cancelled. 
However, then President of Nintendo of America, Howard Lincoln, had promised in an EGM interview that before the end of 1996, you'll see the product at the next Shoshenkai show. And that is exactly what happened. Nothing was heard until the next Shoshenkai event on November 22nd to the 24th, 1996, with a full showing of the hardware. Being a rather bulky device about the same size as the N64 itself, and would attach to the N64 via the expansion port to the bottom, as well equipped with the expansion pack that would raise its RAM from 4 megabytes to 8 megabytes. It would be using magnetic disks that were slated to have 64 megabytes of storage. While not anywhere near as large as the PlayStation disks, it was still significantly larger than the 12 megabytes available at the start of Nintendo 64's life. It was neither a cartridge nor a CD, but a balance between both, as it would not just have more space than the cartridge, but also provide faster loading times compared to PlayStation games, which were well known for having loading screens just to get to another area. The creator of Earthbound, Shigesato Itoi, best put it, CDs hold a lot of data, DD holds a moderate amount of data, and backs the data up, and cartridge ROMs hold the least amount of data and process the fastest. By attaching a DD to the game console, we can drastically increase the number of possible genres. There were a few ways to develop a game for this machine. The first was of course to make it an exclusive game on a single 64 megabyte magnetic disc. Simple and gives that much desired space with decent load times. And that indeed did make it attractive to a number of developers, especially ones who wished to make RPGs, including Squaresoft, who wished to make Final Fantasy VII for it, and X with Dragon Quest VII, or known at that time as Dragon Warrior VII, Intelligent Systems with a new Fire Emblem game, and even Game Freak wanted to make a Pokemon game for it. Not just RPGs, but several other major titles were planned, from Diablo to Kirby 64, Resident Evil Zero, Yoshi Story, Donkey Kong 64, and so much more. The second method of development came in an odd method of utilizing both the 64DD and the Game Boy Transfer Pack that many may know best from the Pokemon Stadium games, an early form of connectivity that the GameCube would introduce with the Game Boy Advance. However, this feature was actually taken advantage of with two of the Mario Artist games that would be released on the 64 disk drive. But of course there was a special third and final method of developing a game for the 64DD, which was to develop a base N64 game on a regular cartridge, but then down the road, release an add-on 64DD disc, with new content that would give the base game a desired expansion. A lot like expansions that existed for PCs then, but now for a console game. This method was going to be used for certain prominent games down the road. But overall this had developers interest in mind, and many even traveled from the US to the event in order to learn more and try to receive development kits for it. However, while those games were planned or in development, none of them were shown off at the show other than some first party ideas that they had both experimented on and were developing including a port of Super Mario 64 to showcase how much better it handles it. Along with an application that makes 3D animated avatars using portrait photographs of people that would later become known known as Mario Artist Paint Studio. Along with this, a reel of games were shown featuring regular N64 games including Mario Kart, Star Fox, and GoldenEye. But also two surprising 64DD games were shown, with Mother 3, or Earthbound 64, being shown in a small snippet here at the end. And of course, it's killer app, Zelda 64 finally received more footage after a year of silence showcasing new dungeons, lands, enemies, and combat. This time, it wasn't just a tech demo either. Taking advantage of the system's RAM, storage, and speed, it truly made it stand above any other N64 game seen yet. And they wished to release this accessory for around $90 American too. While Nintendo themselves were still much more committed than showing off the base N64 and their traditional cartridge format, the hype had now just started around this device, and many looked forward to its development. What could go wrong? At this point, the 64DD had already hit its first delay, as it had missed its late 1996 release date, from when it was first announced in 1995. An expected one with how little was known during its first year, but after its grand showing at the Shoshenkai 1996 event, one could 
could expect its arrival closer to the end of 1997. However, on May 30th, 1996, Nintendo in a press conference announced the system's delay to March 1998 in Japan. Speculation stemmed down to just development on both the discs and the system taking longer than expected. And that fact was becoming more and more clear with how they couldn't even put together a proper prototype yet, as it still did not even show up on display at E3 on June 18, 1997. This difficulty may be what led them to their move on June 9th, partnering with Alps Electric as a co-developer of the 64 disk drive. Alps Electric is a reputable electric manufacturer in Japan, and therefore only made sense to bring them in to assist and manufacture this device too. But trouble for the system wasn't just there on a hardware level, but also software. As president of Nintendo of America, Howard Lincoln would state that the system wouldn't release until there was sufficient software for it. And the software side of things was starting to indeed deteriorate. The competitor console, the Sony PlayStation being out for two years, had made a major dent into the market and overtook Nintendo as the market leader. Despite the strong relation of third-party developers with Nintendo during the SNES era, without a solution to make bigger games being available, and not even a prototype to the point where they even had to team up with another company to get this venture going, the third party just couldn't wait any longer for the 64 disk drive despite the larger disk capacity. And so many jumped ship to the now popular Sony PlayStation that not only offered the necessary disk space needed, but also provided a better contractual deal compared to Nintendo's that had numerous stipulations and rules that they had to follow. And with that, many prominent third party party games disappeared from the 64DD's library, including Japan's mega-hit, Dragon Quest VII, that jumped to the PlayStation. A massive blow to Nintendo to lose this series on an unfulfilled promise of larger storage. Other games were also moved to other platforms, or just outright cancelled, such as Final Doom, a unique Diablo game, Ogre Battle Saga, and a plethora of other games too, while others were redone on future hardware that didn't require an add-on, including Resident Evil Zero on the GameCube, and Seaman on the Sega Dreamcast. Practically, third party was gone from the hardware. Despite all that, Nintendo still assured a lineup of first party games were planned, including not just the big killer app of Zelda 64, but also a Super Mario 64 2, Donkey Kong 64, Conquer 12 Tales, a Pokemon RPG, Pokemon Snap, Fire Emblem 64, Kirby 64, Super Mario RPG 2, Mario Artist based off the Shoshenkai presentation, SimCity 64, and the previously announced Earthbound 64. In fact, legendary producer Shigeru Miyamoto on July 29, 1997, while admitting to the worries of the software lineup for the 64DD, he was rather confident confident that enough games would keep coming after its release to keep it afloat. We're hesitant to say, if the software doesn't come out consistently after we sell the 64DD, we'll be stuck. Don't worry, feel easy about the 64DD. However, just a half a year later in December, Miyamoto admitted to the difficulty of justifying the add-on, believing that it is becoming harder and harder to pitch it to the public, and would have been better if it had released alongside the N64 at launch. At this point of hitting 1998, it was starting to be a good deal after the launch of the console. More and more delays kept being announced, with the American launch delayed to late 1998, and the Japanese launch now delayed to June 1998. Many third-party developers had given up on the 64DD by this point, and not even first-party games were safe anymore. In December 1997, Shigeru Miyamoto would go on to say, Almost every new project for the N64 is based on the 64DD. We'll make the game on a cartridge first, then add the technology we've cultivated to finish it up as a full-out 64DD game. So the era of making it purely for the 64DD was starting to fade, with one 64DD games being converted into regular N64 games, but with the idea of using the 64DD to give them an expansion pack. One of these games was F-Zero X, that had plans to receive an expansion pack that would include a track builder even. But most prominent of these was that of the system killer app. Zelda 64, now called Ocarina of Time, was now a regular Nintendo 64 game. In this case, it wasn't even a problem of how delayed the 64DD was becoming, but rather another unrealized flaw of the 64DD up to that point. 
loading times. In an old Iwata Asks interview, it was brought up that while cartridges can load data instantly, the magnetic disks having moving parts to read disks led to loading times that would lead to Link taking too long to load his motions. Therefore, despite the 64DD being made as the answer to the PS1's disk loading times while offering decent storage for larger games, it was still just an in-between, a master of nothing, just a compromise that neither benefited an action game like Zelda and still not as big as the 700 megabytes of the PS1. But while Ocarina of Time was now a cartridge game, Miyamoto's quote stayed the course, as the team still wished to utilize Ocarina of Time in a conjunction with the 64DD in an expansion called Ura Zelda. And Nintendo made sure this expansion was well known about, by having Miyamoto mention it in every other interview, hyping it up with many new features, from new maps, quests, and so much more on top of the existing Ocarina of Time. While the original kill rap was gone, Ura Zelda was now what was keeping up the hype train for the 64DD going, though to a much lesser degree, as much reason to want a 64DD was fading. Despite Ocarina of Time having a planned expansion, many other 64DD games simply became carts with no plans for an expansion. Everything from Donkey Kong 64, Super Mario RPG 2, which was now Paper Mario, Conker's 12 Tales, which was now Conker's Bad Fur Day, Pokemon Snap, and the planned Pokemon game releasing as Pokemon Stadium. Kirby 64 even was later delayed to the Nintendo GameCube as Kirby's Air Ride. The hype for the 64DD was on the slide, as its software had depleted regardless of some excitement for Ura Zelda. The disk drive was even completely absent from E3 1998, Nintendo had questionably even completely cancelled its 1998 Space World event, which some believed may be due to the 64DD's software shakeup, and so it missed both its 1998 release dates. The 64DD received yet another launch date for June 1999, with the surprisingly still active Mario Artist game being nearly completed. This time, however, it did show up to the August Space World 1999 event. However, earlier in the year, Nintendo had ended their partnership with Saint Giga, who had created the online service for the Super Famicom add-on, the Satellaview, and in June 1999 went for a new partnership for the 64DD's planned online service, the Japanese media company Recruit to make a service called Randnet. Randnet was made into a joint company officially titled as Randnet DD and would handle everything from marketing, sales, and its online network. This wasn't just going to be a simple online service, but a whole package for the 64DD. The 64DD was to be sold with a mandatory subscription to Randnet and would come with the Randnet disk, which was to be used for web browsing, email, and swapping game data like high scores. And so over the summer of that year, two major announcements came. One being a standalone 64 sequel to Ocarina of Time called Zelda Guided, which was being developed alongside the hotly anticipated Ura Zelda expansion. The other, however, while a solid plan was finally in for the 64DD, to the disappointment of many, Earthbound 64, one of the only remaining 64DD games from its initial announcement, was now becoming a regular N64 game, utilizing 32-bit cartridges and cutting it down from its planned 12 chapters to only 9 now. After one last delay, the 64DD released in Japan on December 13, 1999. Two kits were made available to buy by a mail order only. The first was the Randnet Starter Kit that came with a mouse, a modem, and the Randnet Disc that would fit into the N64 cartridge slot. The second kit also included not just everything from the first kit, but also an entire N64 unit in clear black. Being mail order, payment was done via a pay-to-own model. First, the kit that didn't include the N64 cost a monthly fee of 2500 yen, or $23 US. The one that came with an N64 unit had a monthly pay to own model as well, but instead at 3300 yen, or $30 US. And if one wanted to buy it outright, some stores even had a limited supply of units to purchase, at 30,000 yen, or $290 for the starter kit, or 39,600 yen, or $380 for one with the N64 that was bundled in. On top of that, by yearly, subscribers would receive 6 64DD games in the mail, making it essentially very easy to own every 64DD game 
that came out. Want that copy of Urizella to expand Ocarina of Time? No problem. How about that F-Zero expansion? Sure. The 64 exclusive Zelda Gaiden? You bet. On paper, this sounded like a good deal as $23 a month would get you internet and games without breaking the bank on a whole add-on and no additional costs on games. But it was really too little too late. The Nintendo 64 at this point had been out for three solid years and was starting to lean towards its end and that's exactly how long the 64 DD had been delayed as well, which led to a massive loss of games over time and still it lost even more games. Zelda Gaiden, now Majora's Mask, was at last moved on to being a regular N64 game on the summer prior to the 64 DD's launch. And even Ura Zelda was starting to look unlikely, as Miyamoto was even considering releasing it as a standalone special edition regular N64 game. The launch games themselves weren't much. Only two games including Mario Artist Paint Studio and Doshin the Giant, which only one of those really was an actual game too, with Mario Artist being more a creative simulation. In fact, the ran that disc didn't even get released until February 2000, which was supposed to be the main feature of the subscription. Other games came trickling in, Mario Artist Talent Studio and SimCity 64 on February 23, 2000, the F-Zero X Expansion Kit on April 21st, Japan Pro Golf Tour 64 on May 2nd, ironically a sequel to the existing disc game Doshin the Giant came out later on too on May 17, and finally the two last games for the system, including Mario Artist Communication Kit on June 29th and Mario Artist Polygon Studio on August 29th, 2000. In only half a year, all 10 of its software were released, and nothing more, as the 64DD was a commercial failure. Despite the deal not being terrible, all the problems from its major delays to the lack of software left many not desiring the add-on any further, and so it had a very low subscribership. Top that off with how the N64 officially was becoming a last generation console now, now that the Sega Dreamcast had released, which had a built-in online interface right out of the box. In many ways, it was Nintendo's own equivalent to the 32X and Sega CD of the Sega Genesis just a few years back, especially with talks on Nintendo's own next generation hardware at Space World 2000 on August 25th being shown off. There were no talks of the 64DD there, as IGN put it best, the 64DD was D-E-A-D-D. With this commercial failure at hand, Nintendo announced on August 2000 that the 64DD would be discontinued. The subscribership sat at a very small number of 15,000. Any of the major games that people were looking forward to were long gone on either cartridges, other consoles, or just outright cancelled, including the once kill rap Ura Zelda. At this point, Nintendo offered all Randnet subscribers an opportunity to sell their consoles back to them and to anyone who chose to keep it to have free service until the service goes offline. That day was February 28th, 2001, when Randnet went offline and Nintendo and Recruit officially liquidated the Randnet DD later that year. While the 64 DD had failed, it was a fascinating piece of tech that one could say was ahead of its time, providing a more mainstream approach to the internet on a console, a means of non-PC gamers to expand the content of their existing games, which many better know this as DLC nowadays, and overall had the ability to push the console to its limit. But with its add-on approach and massive delays, this just wasn't meant to be. If this had originally came out right at the launch of the N64, and worldwide at that, it might have done a lot better, and stood out as a necessary companion while still having the necessary third-party software too. In fact, it might have even fared better if the magnetic disc was the primary method to play Nintendo 64 games, so all of this wasn't necessary from the get-go. But even with its failure, its legend has lived on, with many who seek the unreleased copies of 64DD games including Ura Zelda, and Earthbound 64, with some such as a technical demo port of Super Mario 64 on the 64DD being found. There even is a custom Ocarina of Time expansion made using the 64DD magnetic disc called Dawn and Dusk that can be used in a similar way one would have started up a Zelda if released. And with how little the add-on sold and its popularity amongst retro gamers, prices have continuously skyrocketed over time and as a must-buy collector piece to many. 
but as it is, the 64 disk drive stands as a testimonial to a massively ambitious endeavor that squandered all potential due to mismanagement of its launch, especially for when the N64 had just come out. But Nintendo wasn't going to stop here with its initiative at taking its console online and downloading new data in that era. Not only were they working on this via the console side, but also their very successful handheld market too, that had a massive install base. As with all of Nintendo's previous attempts at building an online service, they teamed up with an outside company. In this case, it was with the gaming giant Konami to make a jointly owned company called Mobile 21 in order to operate the online service for the handheld. Seeing that this was the year 2000, the Game Boy was on its last leg as the Game Boy Advance was coming out and the idea was to make this a service that could function across both platforms. And so the Nintendo Space World event rolled around in late August 2000 where a plethora of new games were shown off, including not just the Game Boy Advance and Pokemon Crystal, but also this new online functionality for the Game Boy Color and the newly announced Game Boy Advance, called the Mobile System GB. Showing off the design of the cable that you'd link between the Game Boy and the cell phone, as well as being announced to launch on the same day as Pokemon Crystal, is then known killer app. However, while it was going to be released on the same day, that date for the Mobile System GB was pushed up a little over a month from December 14th, 2000 to January 27th, 2001. With the launch came three models, with each model supporting different cell phones in Japan and color-coded to yellow, blue, and red to tell them apart. The blue one in this case covered at least 90% of the Japanese mobile market as those targeted the ever popular PDC phones of the era and this launched for 5800 yen or $48 US. To top this off, it had a service fee of 400 yen or $4 US to register your system with and at a 10 yen or 10 cents US fee per minute of use in Japan. The fees would be charged to the mobile carrier, which the bill would likely come to one's parents at the time, who would be paying for the cell phone service they let their child use. It came with a 15-day trial, and even had some restrictions in case a child spent over 10,000 yen being online to stop letting them use the service for the remainder of the month. A lot of nickel and diming to start, but to some, this was revolutionary with what was to come. Being that this was an online service, a number of games were being planned to take advantage of this, 30 at least in the planning, the most anticipated one being Pokemon Crystal. Pokemon in this era was definitely still hot within the era of Poke Fever, and what game is better to promote your online service, especially when the 64 disk drive had failed at that. It was time to launch a proper game with this service. While it took a month after its launch, Pokemon Crystal soon was able to go online. To go about going online, it wasn't from any sort of menu on the title screen like with many games, but rather going to a special Pokemon Center within Goldenrod City in the game that replaced the Pokemon Center from Gold and Silver's version. This went by a new name called the Pokemon Communication Center. Upon entry, you would have the usual Pokemon Center desk to heal your Pokemon, but once you go to the right, you can see that it is absolutely massive, let alone this had a much grander version of the usual Pokemon Center theme that can be heard here. Now while you have your Game Boy plugged with the online adapter and plugged into a cell phone, you could talk to a special nurse on the right to access the online capabilities. This opened doors to not only play mini games, but also trade and battle with people across the nation. A dream that many Pokemon fans had at that time really, though this was a 10 yen a trade. But not just that, there was also a new Battle Tower mode that was being introduced into Crystal, whereby when you visit the Battle Tower building while connected online, the doors would open up and you can face people from across Japan five times a day with three Pokemon. Top this with how it kept track of the ranking of players here too. One of the more underlooked features was the Pokemon News Network that one could register to in the game at 100 yen a month. While it was neat that it would give you updates on your progress throughout the game, it also gave a number of downloadable content with it. This included receiving a Pokemon egg that could hatch into one of the many baby Pokemon with a 50% rate of coming out shiny even. This was apparently done by receiving an egg ticket from the daycare man to redeem at the communication center while online. A lesser piece of DLC was receiving a new mail background called Mirage Mail for the in-game 
same attachable mail items. But the big prize was the GS Ball. Many know the GS Ball from the Pokemon anime, where Ash received it way back in the Orange Islands and kinda was forgotten about after being delivered to Kurt. So what better way of finally delivering on that hype than offering it as a piece of DLC? When you have all 16 badges, be the minigame, and complete the quiz that the attendant of the communication tower would give you, you'd receive the GS Ball. Much like the anime, you could take that to Kurt and come back to him 24 hours later. He'll have you follow him outside, once bringing up the strange presence within the ball and has you go to the Elex Forest. With the rustling trees around, one can then take the GS Ball and put it inside the shrine. Out comes a level 30 Celebi to challenge you to a battle. At the time, this was the only legitimate way to get a Celebi. The last feature that came with it was an obscure one that at 20 yen per use, one could download data of official Pokemon tournaments that would then be saved onto one's cartridge. Then one can plug their cartridge into an N64 transfer pack and then into a Japanese version of Pokemon Stadium 2 and watch these matches in full 3D. While Pokemon clearly was the killer app to gauge any interest in this, another 29 games were planned for it actually. While data on many of these aren't too easy to attain, it still exists in many prominent ones. The next most popular one in this case being Mario Kart Advance, or Mario Kart Super Circuit. Yes, a Game Boy Advance game in this case. Released in summer 2001, it was yet another first party game to use this online feature. Now unlike Pokemon Crystal, this was nowhere near as robust. In the main menu, there is a third option called Mobile that one can enter. This lets one enter one's login information, ghost data, access world rankings, and access mobile GP mode. Ghost data being being the most prominent feature here. This would allow one to download up to two ghost data of players. For those who don't know, ghost data is data of a player that is collected with the best time on a specific course that you could race against and see if you could outperform them. In relation to that, there was also the world rankings section that lets you see the ones with the highest records in the ghost data that you could download. And then there is mobile GP mode, where one could be pitted against the best times of others throughout Japan. As well, another prominent game was Game Boy Wars 3, the predecessor to the Advance War games many of you know of. This used a feature in the game called the Warnet Center that can be accessed via the communication tower in the game to go online. From there, one is able to receive messages from the center, receive special medals that can enhance units, download new units altogether, and on top of that, download new maps designed by gaming magazine editors. Now considering the company running this online service was jointly owned between Nintendo and Konami, a Konami game having this feature was a no brainer, but the game to receive it was surprisingly a Game Boy Advance Silent Hill game called Play Novel Silent Hill, exclusively in Japan. This was, as the title suggests, a visual novel based on the first Silent Hill game using images and low-res FMVs from the original game. The online service of this offered new scenarios to add upon the original story of the game. This was broken into four DLC segments covering one for each season at 20 yen apiece. The downside to this was that it couldn't be saved onto the cartridge itself, and rather would be held by the GBA's RAM. So as soon as one shuts it off, it was gone. So one must play it as soon as they grab it. And yes, you would have to repurchase it again, in other words. Now, one part I neglected to mention was that every adapter was packed in with a Game Boy Color cartridge called Mobile Trainer. This wasn't so much a game, but rather was a full-on online access cart to send and receive emails, keep a contact list of 6 people, receive mail related to Mobile System GB, Nintendo approved websites, seeing what new content was coming, and editing your account. Now websites you were approved to view was done as a measure to keep it kid friendly along with a mobile specific website to visit for information. It was even possible to download a website in order to view it offline. All of this while there was a counter at the bottom showing you how long you've been online as you were being charged for just being online here. Now mobile golf which is a game similar to Mario Golf considering it was made by the same developer, also featured online capabilities here too. This included new courses for 50 yen apiece, mini games at 10 yen, and new characters including Mario, Yoshi, Peach, and Foreman Spike even from Wrecking Crew at 10 yen. On top of that, tournaments were also held online for 3 months at 50 yen a round. Now there were many other games of much less prominence too. These include Napoleon, which came with a trial mode and 3 weekly maps to download for 30 yen, 
as well as Hello Kitty Happy House, which let one do basic email and share different furnitures as presents. Otherwise, the rest of the games aren't too easy to attain with how obscure many of these titles were, but this is an overall list of the remaining 21 games released. However, there were more with Adapter GB support and development, 8 games in fact that eventually cancelled support for online. These include 2 completely cancelled games such as Beatmania GB Net Jam and Horse Racing Creating Derby, but as well 5 released games including the ever popular Golden Sun, Kuru Kuru Kururin, Yu-Gi-Oh! Eternal Duelist Soul, game that made too much sense to have online, and The Legend of Zelda Oracle games, which at the time were 3 games rather than 2. The Oracle games in this case might have even used the online service instead of the game's password system if this had went through. Now the question is, why did these games not have online support despite making a lot of sense to have them? It's because the service came to an abrupt end. After just a little over a year support, Nintendo announced on May 2002 that they would be ending the mobile system GB service on December 14th, 2002. This would be the ultimate end for all online activity from online multiplayer to downloadable content. Despite some mega hitters being there from Pokemon to Mario, the service just didn't catch on and there were a lot of reasons as to why that might have happened. It was a tool marketed towards children and required them to use cell phones. While in Japan it wasn't too unusual for a child to have a cell phone, it was still another piece of hardware that was required and in addition to that, one had to go through the whole process of registering and setting Setting up. A rather complicated setup for a child really. In fact, this complexity may very well be the reason why it never went beyond Japan. Cell phones, while they were in adult hands in the West, they still weren't anywhere near as common as they were in Japan, let alone a child having their own. Back then, I myself, seeing the setup in an issue of a gaming magazine, had an entire plan just to use my father's phone to do all this. Which, in retrospect, may have led to a plethora of other problems, in the form of costs! The costs themselves in this case being another major factor. It was a heavy amount of nickel and diming. While many are at this point begrudgingly used to the nickel and diming of online functionalities of modern gaming, it wasn't something normal back then. Not only would the game service charge you for a number of the features used, but you also would get charged by your cell phone provider for using the internet. This could add up real fast. In fact, you might have noticed throughout this video that when I mentioned the mobile sections of Mario Kart, the existence of the Pokemon Communication Center, plus the requirement of being online to even use the Battle Tower, as being something you never seen in your own Western copies of the game. And the reason is simple. This service was never planned for the West. And so the features were entirely scrapped when bringing these games over for the West, which unfortunately for many Pokemon Crystal fans meant that Celebi was inaccessible legally. But by keeping a Japan exclusive, this kept the market also very small, and so upon the shutdown of the service on December 14th, 2002, the joint corporation between Nintendo and Konami, called Mobile 21, was officially dissolved. Mobile System GB was yet another failure for Nintendo in exploring the online market after just facing another major failure in the form of the Nintendo 64 disk drive. In fact, both failures happening back to back may be why their next take on online gaming for their upcoming console, codenamed Project Dolphin at the time, had a very restricted approach. Nintendo and the online world have been hand in hand since the era of the Famicom in Japan, where via an add-on modem for the Famicom, the Satellaview for the Super Famicom, and the 64 disk drive for the Nintendo 64, those consoles all had online functionality for everything from checking the news, to downloading games, and even browsing the internet. In many ways, it was done before modern online gaming was even considered, but it was rather niche and unknown to most around the globe, as these were all Japan exclusives. However, all of this started to change by 1998. The world was heavily becoming integrated with the World Wide Web, with more and more computers becoming available in every household, including internet connections. Sega at the time had been dealt a crushing blow with the Sega Saturn, and needed a juggernaut to spring interest in its next generation console. This was where they noticed this trend of interest on the internet, and decided that this should be the selling point of their next console, the Dreamcast, whereby people can play multiplayer with others online, or even attain DLC for their existing games. With that, they included a 56k modem with every Dreamcast released, except in Brazil for reasons, 
and this was all in order to capitalize on it. And in just a month after launch, it was proving successful with nearly 1.55 million Dreamcasts registered online. The future of gaming was indeed looking to go heavily in the direction of online gaming. While Sega was reaping the rewards of that gamble, Nintendo's new next generation hardware was in the works. In 1999, their most recent venture in the online market via the 64 disk drive had proven to be a massive disaster due to the delays and limited market. However, with Sega paving a path for how online gaming should be done on console, it became clear that this is what Nintendo needed to focus on for their next generation console too. In 1999, Nintendo was well on its way to working on their new console, codenamed Project Dolphin. As with previous consoles, Dolphin was being prepared to have powerful hardware to keep up with the Dreamcast and the PlayStation 2, but the difference this time was that online gaming was a must-have. Nintendo EAD General Manager Shigeru Miyamoto believed that this was indeed a necessity too. As stated, there's got to be something Dolphin has with the internet, because from now on, we can't create entertainment without thinking about the network communication. But while it might have appeared that Nintendo was planning to push for a robust online feature much like the Dreamcast, they were at an impasse on how to truly approach it. Within the same interview, Miyamoto felt that they didn't want to go too deeply into it as they wished to focus more on giving a safe experience to children with their regular products. At this point, Nintendo was hesitant to join the online landscape, but knew they had to in some form as pressure was mounting on them by the media and their competition as otherwise they'd be left in the dust. And so the big reveal of the Dolphin, now dubbed the Nintendo GameCube, happened on August 24th to the 26th of 2000 at the Nintendo Space World event. Being heavily focused on these new consoles, a plethora of tech demos and games were shown off along with the console, the disc, the controller, and adapters for online gaming. These adapters were set to be fitted into one of the slots at the bottom of the GameCube. While a regular 56k modem did exist here for dial-up internet, a second adapter was here as well. At this point, high-speed internet connections were becoming popular and Nintendo came prepared with a broadband modem. Sega had already released a broadband modem within the market too for those wishing to upgrade their packed-in 56k modems, so Nintendo had to keep up. Despite this, however, Nintendo didn't formally comment on it at the show. They just existed on display on the show floor. But via a press conference with Shigeru Miyamoto, question did come up on the adapters, which Miyamoto jokingly expressed that people will now think the GameCube is a more multimedia machine, but confirmed the console is indeed set for online. However, this was despite Miyamoto's interview back in February 2000, where he stated that Nintendo would approach online gaming if they develop a unique approach rather than just following suit with the competition. Overall, being unique was what Nintendo's new approach was with this generation of gaming, with them dubbing it as the Nintendo Difference. This was an attempt to make them stand out from the competition and therefore innovate in almost everything they were doing, including the online sphere. And so, being the year of the GameCube's launch, E3 2001 came up and the Nintendo Difference was the tagline they went in with. While showcasing a variety of games, they tried to show one of the Nintendo differences in the form of the Game Boy Advance to GameCube connectivity, where one could connect a Game Boy Advance as a controller to the GameCube. But nothing mentioned of the online capabilities within that press conference. However, despite Nintendo's own silence, Sega, who had recently changed into a third-party developer in May 2001, announced a port of their popular online RPG, Fantasy Star Online, was coming to the GameCube, and showed off a trailer for it at E3. It was becoming an odd instance that Sega cared more for Nintendo's online landscape than Nintendo themselves it seems. The problem seems to have been more an issue of money. The director and general manager of Nintendo at the time, Satoru Wata, felt that the only way they could support building an online network would be if it was profitable, and felt it would need a subscription service, which he felt was something the audience would not buy into a statement that definitely didn't hold ground with that very generation's Xbox Live. In this case, Nintendo themselves were allowing the GameCube to have online capabilities, they just didn't wish to build the required servers and charge fees to maintain them, but allow third-party developers to run their own servers, such as Sega, 
to run their own online games, an approach that would make their console look leagues behind the competition. By the year 2002, the 128-bit era was fully in gear. Microsoft and Sony had robust online spheres, while Nintendo was practically still an offline company. The Xbox had an entire dedicated service to online gaming that had functionality that came straight out of the box. Meanwhile, the PlayStation had its network adapter released later that year, and put into full use. Nintendo's network adapters released last amongst the three in October 2002, just in time for the release of Fantasy Star Online in the same month. The design had been updated for both models and fit into Serial Port 1 under the GameCube. With Sega running the servers and charging a subscription fee, this was no skin off Nintendo's back. However, because the GameCube didn't come with an adapter out of the box like the Dreamcast, Sega still had to adjust the game for offline play too, and thus added an offline split-screen mode. Unlike both the Xbox and the PlayStation, however, the GameCube also did lack USB ports, and therefore no option to plug in a general keyboard, which is where ASCII Corporation developed a special comically large keyboard controller for the console that was released only in Japan. All this just to work with the only available online game on the console at the time. The GameCube had at this point been an improvement over the Nintendo 64 in attaining multiplayer games across the board, so long as the disk space allowed for it. But what kept Nintendo from receiving online third-party games was entirely due to Nintendo's lack of a real strategy to promote it. Both Sony and Microsoft had built a dedicated plan on putting online on the forefront. Microsoft had a unified server whereby third-party companies can let Microsoft host their online games and handle the subscription fee and everything else on their behalf. Sony, while not having a unified server, was promoting its online sphere with its own first-party online games, such as SOCOM US Navy SEALs and EverQuest. Nintendo did neither. No unified server and no first-party games as a means to promote the console as being an online machine. To make matters worse, its online adapters had to be purchased separately, unlike the Xbox and the Dreamcast that came with it. Thus, to the average consumer, the GameCube wasn't even known as an online machine. This this as such deterred third-party developers from even bothering with making an online mode for their games or porting games with heavy online play as most consumers wouldn't even know online is part of the package. A waste of money for any developer. In fact, the first Battlefront game was even proposed to Nintendo to be made into a rare GameCube exclusive, but plans fell through due to the lack of an online strategy on Nintendo's behalf. That along with several third-party developers having at one point signaled interest in developing games for their console, including Final Fantasy creator Hironobu Sakaguchi who wished to make an online Final Fantasy game that would appear on all consoles, including the GameCube. Namco, who even had six games planned that they wished to also make available for the GameCube was there, and Splinter Cell Pandora's Tomorrow was going to have an online mode on the GameCube too, all of which appeared on the other two consoles, but completely skipped the GameCube due to Nintendo's lack of a strategy. As such, Nintendo was losing out big on attaining a plethora of popular online games from that era over the decision that online gaming wasn't going to be profitable as a business model, while instead focusing on trying to promote its not-so-popular Game Boy Advance connectivity mode that led to games that required it, such as Zelda Four Swords Adventure, selling terribly for a console Zelda game. By the end of the GameCube's life cycle, there were only four officially released online games, two of them being Fantasy Star Online and its updated version, Fantasy Star Episode 3, and the Japan exclusive game Homeland. However, owners of the GameCube definitely had a desire to play online. If Nintendo wasn't doing it, many wanted to find a way to do it themselves. The answer came in the form of LAN play. While there are two adapters to play GameCube online, the broadband adapter had an extra functionality, and it was that it let you connect using an Ethernet cable multiple GameCubes. This would allow each GameCube to run independently from one another on their own TV screen in order to play a supported multiplayer LAN game together. Only three games support this function, 1080 Avalanche, Kirby Air Ride, and most famously, Mario Kart Double Dash. While the first two allowed for up to four GameCubes to be hooked up for four-player multiplayer, Mario Kart supports 16 players across eight connected GameCubes. And so enter Chad Paulson, a former director of new media at Warner Brothers Record, had recently enrolled into Indiana University. Paulson had a strong desire to play these three games with his friends, 
But being away at university in Indiana, his friends were nowhere near to play with. His desire led him to start linking up with a variety of other passionate GameCube owners who had been feeling just as frustrated at Nintendo's neglect at providing an online solution to their plethora of beloved multiplayer games. As Paulson put it best, I don't think that there is one gamer out there that owns a cube that wouldn't like the opportunity to play Mario Kart Online. And so this group of frustrated GameCube owners collaborated in making a project that would spoof the LAN capabilities by letting one hook the Ethernet cable not to another GameCube, but instead to a router that would hook straight into one's PC in order to utilize a program to connect one's GameCube to GameCubes with the same setup over the internet. This project was called the Warp Pipe Alpha. This genius take on fans doing it themselves took quick notice by the press of pulling the impossible and the results were impressive with a stable connection at a high frame rate. Paulson himself even claimed that using his university internet connection, he got 55 to 60 frames out of Kirby Air Ride. And over time, updates to the program would come to further stabilize it, and instead could directly connect the GameCube to one's PC. And while many GameCube owners took strong advantage of it, these three games were all that were ever able to go online via this method, as no other games afterwards received LAN support. LAN modes were even planned for Mario Power Tennis and F-Zero GX, but were dropped. While it is unknown what the reasoning was for abandoning any further LAN support, it is possible that as it was a very niche idea that may almost exclusively serve best in tournaments, Nintendo may have not seen the need to spend extra work to work on LAN support as well. By the end of 2005, the generation had ended, and Nintendo had received a crushing blow by falling now to third place, behind even newcomer Microsoft. A plethora of reasons existed for this, but one of those would indeed be online gaming. With a lack of a plan, and a refusal to make one, Nintendo effectively had ignored the coming age of the internet that people in the 90s were accustomed to and interested in. As newer consoles came, Nintendo did finally start to adapt the online sphere, starting with the Nintendo DS and the Wii. This time, many first-party games came out and were officially endorsed and pushed by Nintendo as online-ready games to be played on their new brand of Nintendo Wi-Fi Online. It wasn't perfect as connection issues existed, but they had finally adapted to a long-requested feature. Even so, they were still quite behind the PS3 and the Xbox 360, and this issue kept going for the following generations. While Nintendo would adapt new features, Sony and Microsoft both were also adapting new features. It was, in other words, a game of constant catch-up by Nintendo each generation that still left them a step behind, and it might be all attributed to being basically at step zero in the generation that started console online gaming. But ever since then, further tales came about what really went on in Nintendo's head during that era, most famously from former president of Nintendo of America, Reggie fils on May 22nd, 2002, where he revealed and confirmed a number of details. Most prominent was the confirmation of how Nintendo wished to innovate when entering into the online market, as previously mentioned by Miyamoto in the 2000 interview. Their mindset was that they believed couch play offline multiplayer gaming was what they already excelled at better than anyone, so if they went online, they needed to find a way to excel in online play, something that they struggled to understand in other words during that era. But according to Reggie, once they decided to take Smash Bros online, it paved the path to games like Splatoon being online focused and doing very well especially. While it is far from a unique approach, it convinced Nintendo enough to keep online as a high priority ever since, and still it thrives today through not just online multiplayer, but downloadable games, content, and even playing old games from generations ago. Hey everyone, thank you for watching! Hit the subscribe button for more Nintendo and other games gaming history. Hit the like button and comment below on if you did play the GameCube online, or if you could, which game would you have played online? So everyone, thank you for watching!